But hello, friends. Nice to see your smiling faces. <laughs> Talk about web accessibility, first of all. Most important uh, slide I have to show you today, and that's me on my mobile. I, uh, I am in, um, I got my license in the summer and started racing in the Northwest last summer. The rest of you guys are going to have to always listen to that before I ever say anything. Go. All right. I have been the webmaster of the Oregon Department of Education since uh, 1997. At one position. And I am the um, ODE's uh, web accessibility uh, subject matter expert. What that means is that I just happen to know more about this topic. I, let's say I spend more time in this topic than anyone in the department. That's how I get there. I'm going to start off by saying what I'm not going to talk about. This isn't a primer to, to have you uh, learn about why you should have an accessible website. I'm not going to talk about WCAG and what is WCAG and get into the details for that. I'm not going to talk about uh, uh, the poor principles and, and, and all that. I am going to spend time talking about is the overview of what ODE did uh, to make our web pages accessible. I'll talk about tools that we used. And then I'm going to show you HTML code examples. And I'm going to go pretty deep in that. So uh, I'm hoping that the, the folks that are, that are watching this really get to understand uh, and see real life samples that you're going to need to do in, in your uh, web applications or your web pages. And uh, the other thing is, is to save your questions for the end. If there's any time, I'll answer them. Uh, but you know, I've got 35 minutes here. I've got a 45 minute presentation. So um, I'm going to be moving. Okay, so in 2016, um, the Oregon Department of Education was contacted by the, um, by the federal U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights uh, with two complaints uh, on our website. And uh, they notified us at that time that we were officially under audit. And uh, we then moved to uh, talk about the terms of that audit, what it meant to us. One of the things that we had to do was procure an, an external auditor. So we did that in 2017. And, and part of that procurement, by the way, is they had the, the person had to be uh, on their approved auditor list, and they had to be trusted testers. So they had to know what they were doing uh, so that the, the feds knew that we had an auditor that was, was going to make us uh, toe the line. So we started doing that with them in 2017. Something I want to point out for people that have large, that are listening, that have large websites and uh, are going to go through an audit process is be familiar with this term WCAG EM. Uh, and what that means is it's their evaluation methodology. And it's laid out specifically so that if you have a large website, rather than doing all the pages of your website, you do a portion of it. And they have a method for that. And if you don't address it, maybe you're going to do your whole website. So you're the one that's got to bring that to them to say, we need a proportional one because our site's too big. We're not going to pay a contractor you know, per page for all the pages that we have. So just make sure you're aware of that. The uh, feds, when they said they were auditing the website, it meant the entire website. So that included web pages, our files, PDF, uh, Excel, Word, um, our videos that we posted online through YouTube. And then at the, in the 11th hour, they added external links on us. And I don't know that I'm going to talk too much about that. That was just not fun. Um, but uh, that encompassed the entire website. The uh, thing is going to be, I'm not pushing my slides here enough, am I? OK, the next thing I'm going to talk about is the basic concept of accessibility anyway. If you, if you start off with an, with an accessible template like we have with NIC USA, um, right off the bat you don't have errors. So you start off with that and then you go out and you get a tool and you think that by that combination you're just going to go uh, run your tool and at the end of it when it says you're accessible, that you're accessible and you're done, you're wrong. So change your mindset immediately and what you're going to find out through this presentation is why you're wrong and why that accessibility thing uh, doesn't quite do what, uh, what you think it does. Um, 
there's two types of, of things that are, are going to, two methodologies that you're going to get your website uh, remediated. You're going you're gonna to use tools or you, and you're going to have to do manual processes. And the difference between the tools is tools are, are uh, applications that will either fix or guide you to a fix automatically versus the manual process is stuff that you will look up automatically or you'll have to have that human intervention that makes a decision on what you're going to input and that's what the manual part of the process is. When I first started out with this, I went out and looked for tools and the tools uh, would say anywhere between uh, we're going to get you 70% to 80% to 90% accessible. And I thought, boy, that's pretty good, that'll be good. And then I started looking at it and I was like, there's no way they're going to do that. And so I then had to try and interpret, well, what did they mean you know, that far accessible. And the first chart that you see, 50-50, where I came up with that it was that if you were to take the, the 100, uh, roughly say that you had 100 WCAG rules, and 50 of those WCAG rules would be, would be associated in some way to help with, those, with the WCAG rules. The other 50 would be manual. So that was more of a realistic number that I could get my head around and go, okay, well, that makes sense. But the other one that I had to constantly, uh, uh, that I was constantly asked about was, how long is this taking? How much time are you spending? Is the, are you spending all your time in the tool? Is it helping that much? Or how much do you do on manual? And at the end of the process, we individually wrote down the numbers that we thought that we spent on each, and they matched. We, we came up with 5% of tools. And 95% of the time that we spent was spent on the manual process. So that is an eye-opener, and that's something that everybody needs to be aware of. When we uh, went out to, uh, to put together training uh, for folks right off the bat, we, I went straight for the groups and said, well, you can't, first thing, management comes up to you and they say, oh, go train the employees. Like you're just going to come up with one little training thing and everybody's going to do it and they're going to sign off and everybody's trained and there, there it goes. First of all, anybody who goes and looks at WCAG realizes you're not going to have a training on WCAG and, and, and that fast and everybody's going to be trained. Second thing you're going to realize real quick is what in the heck would somebody need to know the details of this particular WCAG rule that they'll never do anything with it. So we identified groupings instead. The first group that we went after was the new orient employee orientation. And what we do in that process is every employee that comes into the department gets exposed to the idea of a web accessibility. So just the concept of it and, and making sure that there's an awareness. And then outside of that, uh, you have your creators and posters of web pages, files, everything that they're doing. And each of them has different things that are specific uh, to what it is that they're doing and, and where uh, the WCAG rule attaches to that thing that they're doing. Web developers, our web developers that aren't doing things in templates and they're building stuff raw, uh, they have a different set. And, and again, they have to know, in some cases, more. They certainly get into areas of WCAG that other users won't. An example would be advanced templates and things. If you have to do template work, that's not something that uh, generally the other people are going to do. So we had several targets uh, that we had to make sure we were going for. The other thing was to acknowledge that, that we had bodies of work that we were reacting to. Everything that was in our uh, production area, we were being reactive and trying to fix those. And then we had everything that we wanted to be proactive with, which was if we're making something, make sure that what we're making is accessible. So once we kind of got that body of work, um, I went out and, and read through all of WCAG. Great reading. Loved it. So, uh, and a ton. I mean, it is deep. And the first thing you realize when you go through and read it all is it's unbelievable how much there is. And it's way more than you can think. You're, you have this, this feeling of there's, there's no way we're going to get through this. So we know, yeah, you, some, somebody's got to figure it out. You're going to train. You're not going to train everything on WCAG. What I did is I did the same principle that I did in groupings. So I went out to WCAG. I got all of the rules. I imported them into a database. Then I took individual groups of people and tasks and made filters and then associated those to specific rules so that the expectation now isn't, okay, you guy who does videos have to go know everything in WCAG. Click on videos. It will filter out the WCAG rules for videos. That's what you need to know. So that, that was a baseline for things that we wanted to make sure, and that's really how we interface our employees when it comes to WCAG specifically. When it came to tools, um, 
at the very beginning of this, when we got notified in 2016, the first thing that we did is uh, looking around quickly, we found out that the uh, WebAIM tool, which is a, a, a Google Chrome plugin, uh, was the most popular thing that was out there. So we had everybody install that, and that was our first tool that we installed. And it, it's really good at giving you a baseline. When you go open a page, you get a quick overview of what's, what does the tool say that, that it is? How is this page? So we still use it today for that to get a baseline. There are also baked in tools uh, in the, the SharePoint uh, CMS that uh, has things like header order in, in, in it. And they're really handy and easy to use. So you guys definitely are, are, are hopefully already using those tools. For our web developers, they had to choose a tool from a list of applications that the feds uh, gave them. And one of the tools, or the tool that they chose was IBM's DAP tool. And that tool was created to, um, for their own developers. And then their developers liked it so much and their team liked it so much, they made it available to the public. And so after evaluating it and seeing that that was a good tool, that's what our developers then chose. The last one that you see on there is a color contrast analyzer. And that was recommended to us by our external auditor uh, for color contrast. And it's actually a great tool, more flexible than a lot that we saw on the market. We, uh, as we started into the uh, process of the audit with our external auditor, we got tons and tons of violations. And, and we started looking at all those violations and saying, it seems like some of those may be getting a little finicky and going past AA and into AAA. And, and as we pushed back on some of those, we, first of all, we learned that pushing back is not a bad thing. The worst thing they can say is, is, no, it's a AA violation. You have to do it. The best thing they can say is, Oh, yeah, you're right. Well, you don't have to do it right now. So we put those into two categories. And, and we, we took the things that are AAA, and we put them under a category that we would, would lump with best practice. It's something that we should do. So the ideal, then, is that we'll, the stuff that's in, in our production area currently, we're going to fix the violations in there. And then things that we're building out in the future, we make sure we address violations and um, uh, also uh, add to it our best practices so that things are, are coming out nice. A, uh, a big no-no, um, and this, this will happen to most people that will get into this before you realize that you, that you were doing it. When, when you're uh, interpreting the WCAG rules, again, let's just use quick numbers. You have 100 rules out there, and you're trying to say, uh, how how do, does that rule that I just read, how is that going to affect me on this web page? If you view every single one of those rules as a sighted user, you're missing the mark because maybe the person doesn't, can't see. Maybe they can only hear. Or maybe they can't see or hear and they surf the web by feel. And yeah, that happens. Users are out there surfing the web and can't see and can't hear. So you have to be aware of each of those things, when you look at the rule, you have to say, how does that affect sighted? How does that affect someone who can't hear? How does that, uh, or who can only hear? How does it affect someone who's using different tools, like speaking into it versus a keyboard? Um, and, and one of the big things then that you have to realize when you understand all of that is that the tools navigate differently as well. We go on a web page as, as a sighted user and we see our navigation points quickly. We see links and, and, and that they're spread all over the page or where they are. We have a good quick visual that we get that we analyze that page when we see it. The non-sighted user doesn't have that. They have other techniques that they use in their screen readers. And you have to be aware of what those te techniques are and how they work. So if you're not applying all that to WCAG and all you did was cited, you feel like you've got all your, your ducks in a row and you're not done. There's a ton of, of violations you'll find by not um, paying attention to the other groups. So I alluded to the fact that I'm going to be talking about HTML. And the, the one part in here that, that, you're, that you hear very quickly is that if you are working in your website and you're checking it for accessibility and you're using a tool and you're not going into the source, edit your HTML source, in all of the places you can in the console because there's several places that you can go into source that you need to go into source. If you're not doing that, you don't have an accessible website, period. There are things that are happening in behind the scenes in HTML that you have to dig out. So if you don't go in there and dig them out before you post your page, you post it in an inaccessible page. That should wake some people up because 
I say with great confidence that the, the, the biggest portion of the sites that are out here, our sites, are, uh, are going to be that way. Not my site, but your sites. So um, knowing that we were going to go into HTML and all of our web pages, I thought if we're going to go through over a thousand web pages and, and be in HTML, we might as well make sure that they're doing everything they can to, to look good in mobile devices. So knowing that uh, the Bootstrap uh, templates are a foundation in the, in the NIC USA templates, uh, we went through and, and put in responsive uh, classes in the various areas to make sure that when the page resizes that everything looks good and flows better. So, so the side effect of going through web accessibility was that at the end of all that we have a much more, uh, a, a much better website uh, that's more user friendly for mobile. Here's where we go deeper into the HTML. This first one I'm going to show you is the biggest violation. It's the one that will get most everybody, period. Um, you have to wrap everything, all your text, in a semantic wrapper. If you don't do that, you fail. And you fail that uh, audit for that. So the example is, and, and when, first of all, when I, when I say semantic structure, what I mean is that if you have text, it has to be in either a P tag, a TD for a table, an LI for a list, or a header tag. If it's not in a structural tag like that that tells the screen reader this is what the, the type of content that you're getting ready to read, then it's a violation. So what you see in the correct side here where I put the P tags wrapped around that opening sentence, that is a properly wrapped opening sentence. Everything in there is wrapped and that will pass. Um, but the key to focus on here is that the screen reader reads that correct side and it says P paragraph when writing your text all text must be wrapped in a semantic code structure and then it says uh, unordered list uh, list 1 P list 2 LI list 3 TD it gives them and tells them the structure of what each of those things are if it doesn't do it they don't know it but you and I knew it because we opened the page and we looked and we saw it so this is the thing that get, I mean, the, this opening slide here, this is the thing I want to make sure you're getting is that it's, it's, we have to give them the same experience, as close to the same experience as possible that the sighted user has. So you're going to see a lot of this stuff uh, clings to that. Now, from a programmer perspective, you say, well, okay, I better make sure I wrap all my stuff then. So the tendency then is to wrap everything with a P tag to make sure everything is encapsulated with something. So in this example, what happens is they're in the field and they start typing. And then what happens is that the code behind wraps what they just typed in a P tag. And in this case, they did it three different times. And then they went in and they decided they didn't want the text in the first line, so they deleted all the text. Um, in the third one there, they had three hard returns. They deleted two of them, forgot to delete the last one. And then in the final example there, they had five spaces that they put in there. Could have put 100 in there. It doesn't ma matter anything. For us, we would have looked at that. We would have been fine. Sighted user looks at that and says it's fine. To the user with the screen reader, it reads paragraph. Where's my paragraph? They're looking for a paragraph. You've announced that you have a paragraph. And now they're instantly confused because they're looking for it and they don't have it. Next one says paragraph. Says what's in there. It's good. Next one says paragraph. Where's my paragraph? Three times they're told there's paragraph. Three times they're not. Vi one of them is a violation, but you'll see in this example. The reason I used the examples was I wanted to make sure you understood that empty doesn't necessarily mean there's no hard return and no spaces. Empty means there's no text. So you have to watch carefully for that kind of stuff. The thing with uh, the header order, first of all, one of the things that you find out that, that causes header problems in the first place is that we go back to the time when we first started doing uh, headers in our Word docs back in the day and we wanted to make our stuff look nice and so we would grab a, a header one and make it big and bold and then we'd grab like an H3 you know, because we liked the size of it better and we would mix them up and make our document look pretty the way we wanted it to. We do it in email, we do it in, in a Word doc and we carried that same methodology over when we started doing web pages and we're completely using them incorrectly. They're not meant to be style, they're meant to be structure. So they are violations when you use them this way. In this first example, what you find out is that 
they skipped them. They didn't have the correct order. So if you look at the one that says incorrect, you see H2P, H3P, H2P, H4P. They skipped H3. That's a violation. So when you look at the corrected one on the side, when, when you see them go through, you see the H3 instead. Now, H3 reads correctly for the screen reader. They're going to like it. But since we're trying to accommodate our users, too, when we're in the, coming in behind that, we want to give them the same experience. What we did is we, we mirrored those classes, all of our header classes, and we called them MH1 for, for H1, MH2 for H2. And then that way, when we want something to look like it, but it's not it, we can get that look. That's what you see in H3. So H3 is a header 3 that looks like header 4. Looks good, and the semantic part works for the screen reader. In the next part for the header, uh, again, a, a big violation here is that if you have a header, what you're announcing to them is that something's coming. Here's the header. Here's the start of my sentence. And whatever is below it is what is had to do with my, my header. If you put headers back to back, like in this case in the in incorrect, you see an H3 and then followed by an H3. What you're doing to the screen reader again is that person is told, here's a header 3, now they're looking for the details of header 3, and what they find immediately following it is header 3. Instant confusion. They can't see, they're hearing what they're being told, and now they're trying to figure out, well, what did you mean? What, how did you do it wrong? That's why it is a violation. What you see on the other side of it and correct is how, how it's correctly then resolved. Uh, wrap it in a P tag, and then we gave it the class MH3. It then will look the way they wanted it to look, but it passes the accessibility. <laughs> Images are so fun. They're, one of the things that you're going to find out is that, that there's a lot more to images than an alt text. So when, when you're doing images and um, there are so, so much of it is interpretive, trying to figure out when to make it decorative and when not to. But I'm going to point out a couple of things that are just quick gotchas that, that you can look for. Uh, when, when we first started doing this, developers started wrapping the file name in the alt text just to make it ha handy for you. If you didn't put an alt text in, they would put it in for you. This was developers who didn't understand the rule that said that you could put an alt equals uh, quote, quote, and empty quotes, and that then tells the screen reader to just ignore it, which is what you really want to do if it's decorative. But, but they didn't get it back in the day, so what they would do is they would slam a file name in it. When you put a file name in it, you create a, a violation immediately from the point you do that, because it's not descriptive of the image. It has to be descriptive. So uh, what they didn't realize it, but now they're, now they're creating uh, that kind of a, a, a violation right off the bat. They'd have been better defaulting to an, an alt empty quote quote, and then they wouldn't have had that problem. It, they would if the, it was supposed to contain text, but either way, it's, you know, what problem do you want to have? Another image problem that we had, and this, this one uh, uh, I pushed back on until they, they finally actually quoted me the WCAG for it. But, um, this was one that, uh, on the front page of our website, they took a logo and created a banner with the logo. So they had a logo, and then they took a sentence, a paragraph that they put below it, and then put it in a box. And what, what the, the rule says is that if the text could have been accomplished outside of that, and you, you could have got this look and then made that text readable, that's the preference, and that's what you should do. And it says not just that. That's what you have to do. So we then had to take that logo out I put it in a frame with borders and then just made that a paragraph. It looked very similar to what, it, what they wanted and then it, and then it worked. Um, when you get into complex images, one of the things that you find out, in, in this case, I'll just use a quick example. They had a flyer that you see on the right that had a lot of detail in it. And when they first put their page up, they just had an empty page with this flyer on it. Um, and because they liked the flyer it, and it was recognizable, they wanted people to use it. The problem was that the flyer is an image. And how is the person with a screen reader going to read that? Um, you're certainly not going to put all that in an alt text. That's not going to work. So your options here are then to use ARIA. And you're going to go two different directions. You're either going to add that text to the current page, which is the preferred method. And then what you do is you reference the information on the current page through either a single class if you wrapped it in a single class. Or if the information is all over the page, you put multiple classes in your ARIA, and, and they can uh, put it all together on the same page. Or you reference an external file or web page 
Um, but you have to go through those steps. If you don't do that, then it doesn't fly. While I'm talking about ARIA, ARIA is, uh, was, was written and put together for screen readers to help interpret better um, things that, uh, what's the rule? And uh, again, I'm quickly going to say something about ARIA here. ARIA in, in, in JAWS and in NVIDIA, two different screen readers, they interpret these things differently. If you have an alt text in an image and maybe they wrapped it in a link and you have link text, you have link text, alt text, and now you have ARIA. And what's the order that it's going to read? Is it going to read them all? Is it going to read one first? Is it only going to read one of them? What's, what's that going to do? They both interpret it differently. But what you do find is that the consistent thing they do is ARIA first. So one of them may only do ARIA. The other one may do ARIA and then another uh, as well. But when you look at the history of those screen readers, they change that rule every six months. And then they change it back. So you know, that's what you're chasing with that. This language part, this is something that's really important. A really quick way to audit and, and find somebody that fails an audit is I go to a web page and I look to see if there's any different language on that web page. If there's any different language on that web page, I'm ready to put money on it that they did not identify that language part in HTML, which is a requirement and a violation if you don't do it. So imagine when you create your web page, you go into your title tag at the beginning of it and you, you put an attribute that says uh, lang equals en for English, telling everybody that that web page is an English page. But you then later in your page, uh, in my example of correct there, they have a Spanish link. So if you then have to go over into the attribute and say lang equals es to tell them that the thing you're reading next is in Spanish. Below it, what you find is you find an a English text in the title of the link, but what they're doing differently is they're linking to a Spanish file or web page. When you send someone away from your English page to a different language, you have to say what that language is before you ever send them so that they know they're going to a different uh, location. The final example, you see both of those things. And in a case where you have Spanish in the text and then you have a document that you're linking to that's Spanish, you have to include both of those. Miss any one of those, you have a violation. One of the things that's really common uh, is repeated link names uh, with, with different links. And a, a lot of people will teach you that you, you just can't do it. Don't do it. The WCAG says you can't do that anymore. That's not true at all. So when, a, a quick example before the one on the slide, if you go to a web page and you have five articles and, and you see the beginning of the, all five of those articles and at the end of them it says more, you've got a link that says more. And everybody knows what that works and it's a common uh, way of doing it. You want to keep doing that, that's fine. You have to just add ARIA to it. Now I'm going to go to my example here. In our example, it, it, we use English and Spanish links all over this particular page. And if the screen reader reads, and by the way, a common thing for screen readers to do is to, to hop through the links just to see what are the links on the page. So they have a tendency of doing that. So on this page, they would get on this page and it would say English-Spanish classroom connections, English-Spanish sticker, English-Spanish, English-Spanish. So there's, that's what it's saying. That doesn't mean anything to them because you didn't do ARIA, you, you didn't say anything else in your link. So yeah, that as it sits is a violation. But when you look on the right, when you put in ARIA and you give each of them more meaning, when they tab through it, it says, Apple's poster in English, Apple's poster in Spanish, Apple's family newsletter in English, Apple's family newsletter in Spanish. The detail saves your bacon. So you do that in everything that you do where you have duplicates. As long as you're using unique identifiers in your ARIA, you're good. Keep in mind, you don't make one of those unique, you got a violation anyway. So make sure that if you're going to choose a technology option that you execute it correctly or you're still going to have a violation. This one was interesting because we see sentences where you'll have a sentence and in the middle of the sentence you'll make a reference to numeric things in a, in a list. So I'm going to read it real quick. When you type content in a sentence that contains a list, you need one this, two that, three the other thing. So when you put one, two, three in a sentence like that, if you look at the incorrect, what you see is that they wrapped that in a P tag. It was one paragraph and it, it all, they typed it all in there. It's a violation. It's a violation because the moment that you create a list with numerics, it has to be broken out as an unordered or an, as an ordered list numeric so that it reads to the screen reader and they have that option. So when you look at the corrected version on the right side, it starts off in a paragraph, then you see the OL, LI list, 
and we put we created classes for it that will, will handle uh, ODE inline numeric and it will read exactly like the top so it reads like the author intended and it also handles the screen reader so you just it's a gotcha you have to be aware that that's out there contrast problems first thing about contrast problem is that uh, screen readers don't have contrast problems they can't see so they're just they're going to read it right out to them no problem so good news is you don't have to worry about that the contrast problem is for the sighted user and for the people that have uh, um, color blindness and there are varying degrees of color blindness so when you think that you're a color blindness expert because you know the symbols of, uh, of one type you're not there are more than one type so when you use a color contrast analyzer it will do that for you and when it says you passed you passed and you're good to go so big thing with contrast don't try to be a hero and think that you got it down you're going to get a violation when you do when I first started doing this stuff at ODE and I would go around and I would I would sit with people and say in groups and I'd say the first thing I would say to them is did you know that you could fail an audit by naming your web page incorrectly and people would look at me funny it's like what just naming my page incorrectly I fail an audit it, here's a quick example for us we're, we're the Department of Education say we have 50 web pages uh, that, that that has something to do with math everybody has a section and each of those sections has has a math area and in in their section they name their section math because you're already in my section so I'll just name you math then the search engine comes back and it says math 50 times which is the math that's the right one that's why doing that isn't right you have to have a unique uh, name method when you put your names in here uh, by the way the uh, the uh, SharePoint templates from, from Nick USA they do take care of and, and guide you down a path of that pretty nicely so just be aware of that so when we get into files the big thing to remember here is that uh, accessibility checkers when you do your accessibility checker if you have not identified your manual review points you're gonna fail a lot of people will go in and they'll do their checker as soon as the checker at the end of it says they're good they're good they walk away they don't realize how many points in that checker required human intervention to make a determination of what to say as an answer to that question or whatever it was get it wrong you fail and that's a, a really common thing so it's important to make sure that you remember your manual review points for YouTube when you do videos um, one of the biggest things is to make sure we upload our videos and we use automated uh, capturing so the big thing is remember that you have to have accurate closed captions if you don't review those after they've been generated there then they they uh, fail the other thing that you have to make sure is that you have audio descriptions in your videos and an audio description is the concept that I'm standing up here doing a presentation and in the middle of the room there's a basket of apples that I keep pointing at I keep pointing at everybody in the room sees them everybody that's watching the video uh, um, may or may not see it if it's off camera so if they're if they can't see it all and they're just listening to it they really didn't see it right so it's important to make sure that if that's a part of your prop that you're referencing in your video that you reference it and say and uh, here's the basket of apples this is what we do with it this is how, how we interact in teaching your people that create your videos to include audio descriptions up front they don't then later have to come in and put audio descriptions in later and anybody that that has to do that all video makers should have to do that because they do it once their very next presentation they're speaking their audio descriptions because they're going to get them right the other um, part of that is that closed captions are a nightmare so not closed open captions you don't want to do open captions you're you're way more limited when you come down to to audio descriptions when you do them the only thing I'm going to say about external uh, website links is that we made a deal with them and 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 organized those external links into different groupings and had different deals for each of those groupings um, when you're going through an audit that's something that you'll uh, negotiate and find out what is it and how do you have to handle those but I won't get into them now because they're going to be unique to whoever you're doing it with. When, uh, we, when it comes to posting and QC, how are we going to keep the ODE website clean moving forward? Uh, so we asked management, um, you know, are you going to train all the employees? They already told us they're not going to train employees HTML. So if they're not training the employees in HTML, that means that someone else is going to have to go in and do that. Are we going to do it on the front end before it goes out? Or are we going to do it after the fact? 
They don't want us doing it on the front end when it goes out. They want it seamless to the users. Users need to be able to go out, do their job, post their stuff in a timely manner, not having accessibility slow them up. So the process that we're using is they put their stuff out. Within a couple of weeks, we go behind it, we QC it, we fix the file, and then we publish it then, and wait for them to screw it up again, and then we repeat the process. So the final thing I'm going to close with is uh, before you run around telling the world that you have a completely accessible website, I'm going to read something that's pretty pertinent here. You need to understand that uh, the certification is limited by the knowledge of each and every person involved in your creation, update, and QC process, and their awareness of every assistive technology on the market, and their awareness of a variety of versions and settings that every tool uses those assistive technologies has. Wow, does that sound fun. Quick nutshell, well, how does that affect you? If we tell our web, our web uh, people, our, our web developers, you have to, your application has to work in Internet Explorer. And if they make a patch, you have to make sure you test it, that patch works. That's fine. Now they add Chrome to the, to the thing. And Windows updates and all the things that happen that screw those two browsers up. Now carry that over to the same things happening on screen readers. You have JAWS that now you're trying to support. And then NVDA that you have to support. What are their settings? What do they change? How do they interpret? So what we are asking our people is to know all of that. Is that realistic? I just want you to be aware of that. So when you're running around jumping up saying, we did it, all right, we're accessible. Yeah, right. You know, you, you're as good as you can be with what you did and how you did it. So just make sure that the, the when I say this, I'm saying it more for when I'm in a meeting with my boss, I want to make sure my boss really understands really the real deal. Because I don't want somebody coming back to me later saying, you said we're accessible. So. Oh. Get accessible. That's it for me. Got any questions? If there's time, if there's not, I'm good. So the question was, um, when I compiled all the WCAG rules and put them in a database and then associated them to individual categories for filters, um, I made exports of those in XML and then I went into, uh, into our public pages and, uh, and made that available. So it, it pulls the XML, it's dynamic, so that part's nice. Uh, I don't, we, we have not linked to them anywhere. We have internal links that, that uh, point to those. But when I built them and put them out there, I put them out there with the reason that maybe they'll want to at some point. That's not a, that's not a me decision. And you can imagine where that really goes from ODE's perspective is that if it's on our site, does that mean that all of a sudden people are going to try and call me with their accessibility questions? So I, I don't know what the end result will be, but that's a good question for you. Uh, Suzanne, to maybe move forward and then see, because I do what I'm told. So, and I know you do too, so escalate it and we'll see how that goes. But yes, the, the body of work, there's a lot of work to it. And most people that would hear me say that would go, well, I don't want to have to do that, especially if somebody else has, has done it. By the way, nobody else has done it. I looked all over for it and couldn't find, I couldn't even find an XML dump. The fact that I had to scrape those into a, a database in the first place was a nightmare. No questions. No questions online. That's great. That means everybody got every word that I said, and you probably already are doing it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Okay. Uh, thank you, Larry. Oh, that's right in my eyes. Um, okay. So just a quick reminder. Uh, Larry and the Department of Education were actually working to satisfy a federal audit. And um, in the state of Oregon, we don't actually have any required by law standards. So what we use here, what we suggest is a WCAG standard, a AA. We're aiming for AAA, but that is a work in progress. So what we like to tell everyone is, like Larry was saying at the end there, uh, keep it a work in progress. So do continuous improvement. Don't bottleneck your pipeline, but make sure that you're paying attention to accessibility because it's not a one-time thing. It's not like your website is accessible and you're done and you did your job. But no, every time someone posts something, you're going to have to keep on making sure that that content is accessible. So thank you so much, Larry, and that was a great lesson. And uh, re you're really setting the standard for the state there at the Department of Education. So something for all of us to look up to.